um, I feel like I was set up to fail because I would follow people who, number one, have beautiful, elaborate PowerPoints and exotic European accents. Uh, I'm from DC and I hate using PowerPoint, so sorry. Um, but no, I, I'm really, really honored to be here. Um, the reason I hate using PowerPoint is that I'm the daughter of two pastors, which means I am biologically incapable of saying the same thing the same way more than once. Um, or without a choir, but that's neither here nor there. So. Here are the four things I want to cover um, in the presentation today. First, I'll tell you a bit about who I am, just so you know why I'm talking to you. Two, what time it is, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. Three, what my assessment is of what's needed right now in the US-based youth media field. And four, I'll tell you briefly about a, a new project uh, that we're working on. Um, but let's go right in. Just click on it like that. To the right. All right, the beginning. All right, so I said I grew up here in Washington, D.C., born and raised, um, graduated school with a degree in public policy and African American studies. What do you do with that? I did not know. Um, and I came out and started working at a nonprofit called the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, an amazing, amazing organization. It's the nation's oldest and largest civil and human rights coalition. Um, and through that work, I was privileged enough to work with people like at, uh, the NAACP and here at the Human Rights Campaign, um, National Organization for Women, all of these historic, huge institutions um, with a mission to advance civil and human rights in this country. Um, but one of the challenges that I had while I was there was recognizing that while all of this work was fantastic and effective, there was a disconnect between, at that time, there was a disconnect between that work um, and my generation and young people. Um, and I was frustrated by that. And I wanted to know, well, am I not seeing young people here and at these events and doing this kind of advocacy because they don't exist and they're not interested? Am I the only one? Or is it because there's something about the way in which we're doing our work? Is there something about the voices and the stories that we're telling that isn't resonating? Um, and I figured out that it was the latter. Um, that young people are, and I, when I speak about young people, I'm referring primarily to millennials, those born between uh, 1982 and 1999. There are a couple different definitions, but that's the one I work with. Um, I found out that young people are incredibly engaged, civic-minded, motivated, care about issues in their community, but there's a certain way in which we need to be engaged um, in order to have that manifest itself in, in, in real impactful social change. So for me, this is where it all began. Um, I left that work and ended up being the director of advocacy at a youth organization called Campus Progress unbelievable, amazing organization that was really led primarily by young people. Um, and we, our mission was very simple, to support young people around the country in advancing the issues that they cared about that matter most to them. Um, and so in that role, I was able to travel, travel the country. We had presence on over 500 campuses. And not just talk, but listen. Listen to young people and hear what are the issues that you care about? What are the campaigns you want to run? What are the problems in your community? And then more importantly than that, how do you want to have an impact? What is the easiest way for you to use your gifts, your talents, who you are, your skill sets, and impact in the world? Um, and I see people pointing, that is Ryan Gosling up there. Yes, I see. Yeah, he came to our conference. Uh -huh. um, I see you Yes, yes, it was. Um, but he came to our conference to speak about um, the anti-genocide work he was doing in Darfur at the time. But the, that experience totally changed my life. I said, you know, there's a way in which we can actually engage this generation in social change work that is relevant, that is modern, that is fun, that is current. Um, and that became kind of my life mission. And in, in that process, I kind of stumbled into using media and digital media as a tool um, to do that. Uh, after a couple years, I ended up where I am right now at an institution called Citizen Engagement Lab. And our motto is social change can happen faster than you think. And we're an accelerator for online social change projects. So what we do is we help individuals who have a creative idea for a campaign or for a project, for a video, to actually grow those into um, long-standing capacity building institutions. How do you do that? We give them strategy, support, resources, and these are just a couple of the projects we've incubated and accelerated um, that are online right now. So working with African Americans, the second one is women. We've helped, um, we worked with Rock the Vote this year for the election cycle. Artists My Occupation is a group of artists that have, are connected to the Occupy movement who really want to kind of get their voice out about the 99%. Uh, Latino organization, youth involved in um, healthcare reform. But these are just a couple examples. Um, and throughout all of these, there's been, been a key thread that voice equals power. And that's something I've learned over the past couple of years. We've had all these fun experiences. That's me, that's me, that's me, that's me. But I've been doing that. People are like, oh, you're a change maker. No, 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 no. I'm simply a 
a witness to all of the amazing change makers that are around the country. In each of those examples, all I'm doing is talking about the work that young people around the country are doing. Um, and there are so many stories that I, I can't get into right now, but I will trust me a little bit later. Um, but voice equals power. And I've really been exploring how do you actually amplify the voices of young people that are around the country doing amazing work in their communities. First, I said I was going to tell you what time it is. We have to recognize the times that we're in, right? So these are times of amazing opportunity. That image right there, I don't know if you're not familiar with that, is the first image that came out that was inviting folks to participate um, in the Occupy Wall Street movement. Um, this represents protests. You see social media. Um, you know, design core, there's all of this exciting, really cool stuff happening right now. This is global, but I'm referring mainly to the U.S. Um, but at the same time, we have all of this tremendous opportunity and all of these stories about how people are changing the world and doing amazing things. These are also the same times that we're in, right? That there is incredible student debt, there's growing inequality, we're called the lost generation, politics is polarized. And I bring those two stories together because I want to know that as we're telling those stories, who are the main actors? Who are the people that we're elevating as successes in these times, right? Oftentimes when you hear about young people, you look in the media and you say, well, who are the examples of people from our generation who are making change and being really creative and innovative? This is kind of the profile of what you see, right? This is Tom from Tom's Shoes. We know this is Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook. There's kind of this mold of what an entrepreneur and a social entrepreneur or a change maker looks like, right? And I'm not just referring to the outside. Coming from a certain background, having a certain set of resources and relationships, a certain educational background, there's kind of this model. But that model is nothing like what I've seen over the past six years, right? What about the people who are on community college campuses? What about the young women? What about the people of color? What about first generation immigrants? Where are those stories of those change makers? Um, and so this is kind of a theme of what I've learned and has kind of come, come to be crystallized now in the next project we're working on. First is there's a need to change the narrative. I told you PowerPoint is my thing, okay? Don't judge, don't judge the slide. Um, we need to change the narrative. The narrative about what young people are doing, how they're impacting the world around them, not just so that other folks can agree that millennials are cool. It, it's not just about that, but we also need to change the narrative about ourselves so that young people can see examples in the media of people who look like them, who have their background, who have their shared experiences, living high impact lives and actually creating social change. So first is changing the narrative. Second is representation. And that's the very practical part of what I was talking about. How do we elevate and tell the stories of people that look like the diversity of America? The millennial generation is not just the largest in American history, but also the most racially and ethnically diverse. So how do we tell all of those stories? Inspiration. Maybe this is a preacher's background on me, but I like media that actually makes me feel that I can do something and be something bigger than myself. And if you look at the national media, mainstream media landscape, not online, but the mainstream media landscape, there's not a whole lot of inspiration for this set of people for changing a narrative representation. There's not a lot of practical tips and tools and examples of how you can actually change the world. And the last one, my personal favorite, <laughs> overall goodness. I guess this would be your, your fun pill, right? It's a matrix example. This is how do we do it in a way that actually is really relevant and current. I've been a part of a lot of projects where people kind of create youth media who are not youth. And you know, very well-meaning, really, really inspiring. They change the narrative, they got the right representation, but they're lacking some dopeness, right? They're lacking the artists, they're lacking the culture, they're lacking the hip hop, they're lacking the whatever it is that is actually moving our generation. So these are the four things that are really, really critical um, in developing media for young people, with young people, by young people that can actually inspire social change. And I found that in my experience. These are some of the stories that are being highlighted in the media that we're working on now at Citizen Engagement Lab and the new project I'll tell you about a little bit. Jamira Burley. And Jamira is now 22 years old. She is one of 16 children. She grew up in um, some of the worst neighborhoods in Philadelphia. And when she was in high school, she went to school one morning on Halloween um, in 2005. She went to school uh, on Halloween morning, came home, um, and discovered that her 19-year-old brother had been brutally murdered in her front lawn. And 
and that when you hear, and I cannot do her story justice, but when you hear her tell her story, the interesting thing was she said she was almost numb. She came home, she heard the story, she did her homework, she went to bed, she woke up the next day, and it was as if it almost hadn't hit her because violence was so prevalent in her life and her community that it just kind of, it, it, it blew by her. What she decided to do for a while, she said she was shut down, she was broken, she was looking for stories that she could relate to that said, I've experienced this and I've overcome this level of violence. And she couldn't find any. So Jamira decided to become a community activist. She helped launch the Philadelphia Youth Commission. Um, she's now an accomplished public speaker. She's a Student Peace Alliance Fellow. Um, and her story is one of the stories being told in our new media project. The Million Person Project, and again, the, let me just, I should just explain. This was created in Keynote, not PowerPoint, so there's a, the conversion made a little bit. It, it was prettier at home, I promise. <laughs> the Million Person Project, um, created by a couple, I don't know if you can see them, the woman, the blonde woman in the corner named Heather, and the guy in a red shirt named Julian. Uh, they worked for the past three or four years in nonprofits in San Francisco, um, had the same kind of epiphany that I had, that not enough young people were getting their voices heard and their stories heard. They decided to launch a project with very little money. These, these are not people who had like you know an angel investor come in and say, take a million dollars. They just scraped together what they could find and started something called the Million Person Project. And their goal was to travel, not the country, but the world and actually use the power of storytelling. Teach the way um, for young people to engage in, in, in effective, impactful storytelling and elevate those stories of social change agents around the world. And their project just it launched in 2011 um, and they came back from their first worldwide trip. Um, and if you go to their website, which I'll tell you at the end, I'll put up on the slide, um, you'll see all of the stories of the young people that they've collected as well. Catchafire.org, we talk a lot about um, young social entrepreneurs, and when you're looking at the mainstream media, again, you hear about the, the Mark Zuckerberg, you hear about Tom from Tom Shoes, but you don't hear about Rachel Chung. Rachel was um, a young woman, college graduate, started off, got a job um, in investment banking right around the time that that wasn't a hot job to have. Um, and she soon lost her job and recognized that she had all of these skills um, and didn't really know where to apply them. And she looked around, and as most millennials now recognize, a lot of us have a lot of skills and no jobs to apply them at. So what she decided to do was start an organization that paired um, people who had um, you know, graphic design skills, marketing skills, all of these really valuable skills to nonprofits that needed them, but didn't have the money to pay. So it's a volunteer exchange. It's called catchafire.org. Um, it's been written up in Fast Company. But again, these are the stories of young people that you're not hearing that often. Um, this is the last story I'll tell you. D1. D1 um, was a young high school student in Louisiana um, almost decided he didn't want to go to college because he was so frustrated with the violence in his community. Instead, decided to go, came out, thought he maybe wanted to be a teacher. On the side, he'd been um, a musician and an artist, but said, there's no career in that. There's no way. I don't want to talk about the stuff that other people are actually talking about. I want to talk about positivity. I can't do that for a living. Of course not. So I'll be a teacher. He taught um, for two years in, in middle school and then decided, you know what, I've got to go for it. And so uh, in 2010, D1 came out with his first album, um, and it's a positive social change message, but it's, it's amazingly high quality, good hip hop music. Um, and since that time, has now traveled all over the world. He performed at South by Southwest. He's been featured on a lot of other artists' mixtapes. Um, but he is now kind of considered one of the considered one of the up and coming hip hop artists of our generation, being positive and supporting positive messages in our communities. Um, and so what are we doing with all of this, right? The concept now of a project that we're launching, and I'm doing it somewhat on my own, but a partnership with Citizen Engagement Lab is called Foolish Enough Media. And it's inspiration for the unconventional change maker and people foolish enough to believe they can change the world. That's the concept. It's for young people who want to change the world, who want to create social change projects and do all sorts of positive, positive, radically um, uh, unique and impactful things, but don't have any models of what that looks like in the mainstream media. Um, and so Foolish Life is going to be short form video content shows, interviews, graphics, and other creative content developed by young media makers, not just me. A lot of the young people that you just saw profiled there that I said were elevating their stories, they'll, that same set of five young people are involved in this project as well, and they'll be developing media and sharing it on the Foolish Life website so that we can support other young change makers. So that's the core of that project. I gave you a couple of the websites here, but the key here is that, it, as we've talked about, I'll 
kind of take the liberty to tie a little bit of a thread together between all three of our presentations. They're all very different types of projects, and they're all happening in very different parts of the world with very different cultural contexts, very different audiences. But the core here is about young people being empowered to create media that has an impact. And that's what's missing from the mainstream media landscape. And my work that we're doing, all the work that we're doing, and the work that Internews is doing is so vitally important because we're not creating media for media's sake. There's a core thread here, and that is that this media that young people are creating actually has the potential to change lives, change the world, change the communities that these young people are coming from. And so we continue to need, and I know that Internews continues to need, all the support of people like you. So thank you so very much.